Syndic Corporation was formed in December 1997 after the merger of two other businesses, Hospitality Franchise Systems and CUC International. The merger of these two companies created a business that was a leader across several industries. At the time, Sendent was the world's largest hotel franchiser, operated the second largest car rental business, controlled the largest non-municipal car park in the United Kingdom, operated the largest tax preparation service, the second largest tax preparation service in the United States, and also participated heavily in real estate services, insurance, and loyalty marketing with revenues exceeding $4 billion annually. Although on the surface, Sendent looked successful, it was actually responsible for one of the largest accounting frauds of its time. Beginning in the mid-1980s, senior management from CUC orchestrated a way for the company to make sure that it always met Wall Street's earnings estimates. The company accomplished this through the use of several techniques. First, they overstated revenue through manipulating revenue recognition, liability accounts were used improperly, and maintaining inadequate balance of liability accounts and occasionally reversing these balances into operating income. In total, the fraud over the years added over half a billion dollars of income to fiscal years 1996, 1997, and 1998. After the fraud was discovered in 1998, those involved began reaching settlements with the SEC. The penalties for these individuals ranged from small monetary fines to serious share plan. Following these settlements, a class action lawsuit was led against Sendent by some of the country's largest pension funds. The suit asserted that the funds paid more for the shares of Sendent than they would have had they known the true financial position of the company. The resulting judgment for this lawsuit eventually led to a $3.2 billion settlement, which would be the largest of its kind until WorldCom happened six years later in 2005. The lawsuit also required the Sendent needed to make several changes related to its corporate governance structure. Many of these would end up being implemented in Sarbanes-Oxley in 2002 as well. The changes included that the nominating, audit, and compensation committees would need to be made up of entirely independent directors. The majority of the board would have to be independent within two years of the settlement being reached. Directors would need to be elected annually, and employee stock options could not be repriced except under specific circumstances such as stock buybacks or splits. Another significant occurrence in the case was the settlement that was reached between Senda and Ernst & Young. The resulting settlement held an outside accounting firm liable for failing to detect fraud within a company. The basis for the lawsuit was due to the unmodified opinions that Ernst & Young had issued over the years, including three annual reports and seven quarterly financial statements. This was largely due to the auditor's lack of professional skepticism and heavy reliance on management's frequently changing assertions. Ernst & Young agreed to settle the case for $335 million dollars with Sendent. Even today, this case remains the largest amount paid by an accounting firm in a security, a security class action case. In this case, the company used several techniques in an attempt to smooth net income. Sendent was motivated to report stable net incomes and hide inadequate balances. They improperly timed cancellation write-offs by waiting until a few months after year-end to record the write-offs. The bank accounts had a different story to tell regarding these member cancellations. There was a clear difference between the year-end cash balances reflected in the general ledger and the balance in the bank accounts. Keeping those cancellations off the books, overstated cash and understated expenses related to uncollected member balances. This misleading practice by Sendant was to ensure the current year's financials were consistent and would take the loss in the subsequent year where they had more time to smooth out those losses. This also motivated Sandan to perpetuate the income smoothing practices in following years because now they were locked in to cover up those losses and whatever new losses came about. Sandan's senior management would also intentionally overstate reserves as well as the restructuring charges related to a series of large mergers and acquisitions. They would then improperly reverse those reserves in order to increase operating income, a clear indicator of income smoothing. Income smoothing is not an ethical practice if it serves to mislead investors and the public of the true nature of the financial position of the company. An ethical example of smoothing net income could be simple accrual accounting. The purpose of accruals is to smooth net income mainly due to timing differences of revenues and expenses and cash inflows and outflows. An example is that a customer might not have paid for a product yet, but the company has satisfied all the criteria in order to recognize revenue. They will record revenue even though the customer has not paid yet for cash to be received. This is completely ethical as accounts receivable is a non-tangible asset that has been created for this timing purpose. 
One of the criteria of recognizing revenue is that it is reasonably assured to be collected, which will credit the accounts receivable and debit cash. It is merely a common timing difference. In creating a system where it is possible to manipulate these numbers over time by using different estimates or techniques, a great area forms of what is accrual accounting and what is earnings management. An example where it isn't as clear and uses professional judgment would be if the product is delivered and billed, but there is a statute in the contract that allows the customer to terminate the lease at any time without cause. Then the revenue must be reserved against, and the reserve will ultimately be reduced upon completion of the contract and full recognition of revenue. However, this is one of those areas where it is a discretionary estimate and would ultimately affect net income based on the estimate chosen. This could either be done ethically and reasonably with a strong foundation to support the estimate, or the reserves could be estimated in cookie jar reserve fashion. This is an unethical practice where reserves are overestimated in good years and then management re-estimates the reserve calculation to a lower amount in future years when needed to prop up earnings to show stable net income year over year. The difference between ethical income smoothing and unethical income smoothing lies in consistency as well as a strong foundation for estimates or changes in estimate. The estimate and the policies in place for accounts like reserve accounts, allowance accounts, and cancellation accounts should be stable practices that are used in the same manner month after month. If there is a change in estimate, there would need to be a strong foundation to support it. That is how to smooth income for timing differences in an ethical way. To smooth income using creative accounting techniques does achieve the goal of showing investors stable and consistent income year over year. However, those creative and inconsistent techniques are where it crosses over into unethical income smoothing. According to the fraud triangle theory, there are three conditions generally presented when fraud occurs. They are incentive or pressures, opportunity and rationalization for the fraud. Through our analysis, we found that all these three components all appeared in Sandon Corporation case. Furthermore, the company was not actively working to prevent fraud. So we see the components occurred repeatedly in a long period of time. Incentives are the triggers of the fraud. The financial stability and profitability was fluctuating because of the economy and entity's operation conditions. Profitability was the primary incentive for the executive and the senior management of CUC to conduct this fraud. CUC was a publicly traded company on NASDAQ. Its stock price was closely related to the performance of the company. Walton Fox, the former chair of the board of directors, and E. Sheldon, the former vice chair, directed the management to make fraudulent adjustments to CUC's financial reports to defraud the investors. And in the meantime, they were profit by selling the company's common stocks. Pressures also existed in this scam. First, the company received pressures from third party. CUC made fraudulent changes to its financial reports in order to meet the financial results anticipated by Wall Street analysts. Second, the employees at CUC received pressures from the higher level of the management. The senior management instructed personnel at every level to make fraudulent entries. Also, the senior management have the financial incentive from selling the company's stock at an inflated price. CUC's operations provided opportunities to engage in fraudulent financial reporting. 
the unethic tone started at the top. NCUC's executives and the senior management were responsible for the different accounting methods to manage the inflated earnings. For example, the management kept the reject and cancellation of book to not against the cancellation reserve at the last three months of every fiscal year. This policy helped CUC to understand the reserve and inflate the earnings every fiscal year end. The management also overstayed the restructuring charges and the resultant reserves during the merge with HFS, and then used the reserve to offset the normal operating costs. However, the auditors from EY didn't pay attention to the red flags. The auditor overly relay, relied on the report of the appropriateness of the reserve from the Satan management and performed little substantial testing. CUC adapt procedures to rationalize its long-lasting fraud from EY auditors. They back these accounting entries. The accounting department carefully withheld the financial information and schedules to avoid the EY auditors from discovering the fraud. They also ensured the company's financial results did not show unusual trends, which could trace back to the fraud. The rationalizations made by the management were likely related to what Wall Street wanted to see, which is stable and consistent net income. CUC held this as one of their highest priorities and rationalized that it is necessary to smooth out net income over periods in order to have a successful stocks. For EY, professional skepticism is essential in making professional judgments throughout the course of an audit engagement. In order for a competent auditor to exercise professional judgment, he or she should possess common characteristics of a skeptic, such as questioning and careful observation, probing reflection, looking beyond the obvious, and suspension of belief. The role of these characteristics during an audit engagement is crucial in order to conduct a thorough investigation the client is performing proper accounting procedures and that internal controls are effective at preventing his statements. Professional judgment, along with professional skepticism and the fundamental concepts of independence, all contribute to audit quality. In order for EY to both plan and execute a successful audit, they must be independent, technically proficient, and exercise professional judgment. Under the AICPA Code of Professional Conduct, EY and any other competent auditor has an obligation to follow ethical principles of independent thought, objectivity, and due care. EY failed to meet these ethical obligations due to the fact that they failed to recognize any evidence that the company's establishment and use of the Sandat Reserve did not conform with GAAP. It is evident that EY failed to exercise due care when requesting support for the establishment of the Sandat Reserve. They were provided with two inconsistent drafts of schedules. The inconsistencies and various revisions between these two drafts never gave EY the inclination to obtain proper analyses, documentation, or support. This illustrates EY's failure to act as competent auditors with respect to the obligation to exercise due care. To further identify EY's failure to meet its obligations of due care, the EY defendants did not adequately test the collectability of reject, rejects that Sendan failed to record for three months and the adequacy of the cancellation of Sendan's reserve. Now, although EY failed to meet their ethical obligations to exercise due care on numerous accounts by missing red flags and issuing a clean, unmodified opinion, it is still difficult to argue that they failed to meet the ethical obligations of independence and objectivity under the AICPA Code of Professional Conduct 
with the given information. In order to meet these obligations of independence and objectivity, a competent auditor should maintain a mental attitude of impartiality and intellectual honesty and be free of conflicts of interest. The case did not mention any conflicts of interest between Sendant and the partners at EY in charge of the engagement. There were no counts of collusion that occurred throughout the audit. EY just heavily relied on Sendant's management's representations concerning the appropriateness of the reserves and performed very little substantive testing to thoroughly ensure proper establishment of the reserves. The most significant aspect of the case between Sendant and EY was just EY's failure to maintain professional skepticism throughout the entirety of the audit engagement. A major breach of trust occurred due to the corporate governance structure within first CUC and then Sendant following the merger. Walter Forbes, the CEO and chairman of the board for CUC, was responsible for starting the fraud back in 1985. Kirk Shelton, the president and COO of CUC, helped to keep the fraud going when he joined the team in 1991. The two later went on to become chair and vice chair of the board of Sendin after the merger. Because these two were such high-ranking executives and they also held such key positions on the board, it was relatively easy for them to exert influence to orchestrate the fraud and also help cover it up. To do this, Forbes, Shelton, and other members of senior management used several different techniques. First, management provided materially false representations to Ernst & Young regarding their conformity to the gap. The company also participated in backdating accounting entries, making entries in accounts that would receive little to no attention in audits, withholding a lot of relevant information. They also smoothed income in ways that would make it look less suspicious to auditors, and also made sure any entries that they made would not affect numbers that they had previously given to the auditors. Once this culture of fraud and cover-up began, Forbes and Shelton continued um, to keep it going by participating in a lot of mergers and acquisitions in order to create artificial reserves which they could then use to cover up the money that they had uh, falsely, falsely created. This could have potentially been prevented internally had the board been made up of only independent members. However, by allowing the CEO and COO to be chair and vice chair of the board, send in allowed this opportunity for fraud to exist. Members of Ernst & Young also could have done more in regards to keeping a questioning mind. However, they simply relied on assertions given by management and actually even allowed management to pick samples in certain instances. Overall, the auditors were much too trusting of management. Um, this led to management just kind of, once they got away with something, they just kept going, kept going, and um, the just trust broke down even more between the auditors and management. Uh, the executives at Ascendant continued to be motivated and pressured by higher earnings with no ethical tone at the top to guide them in times of losses. And this, this just ended up eventually leading to the fraud being caught in 1998.